today we're going to talk about navigating in cities. And what I want to do is to make the argument that the way that we design cities is not the way that our brains evolved. Our brains naturally use to find their way around. So we've been studying how the brain makes a map of space. And when you think about how the brain evolved, we evolved in the savannas and forests of Africa, and we evolved to be very integrated with our surroundings, to use the natural features of the landscape for orienting, to use the hills as directional information, to use uh, rivers and forests and trees and all of these types of information. So as neurobiologists have looked into the brain to try and understand how we make these maps of space and these navigational plans, we've identified a number of systems which we think are present in all vertebrates. So they evolved a long time ago. And there are two of particular importance that I want to highlight. One of them is located in the striatum, which is this red region of the brain. And the striatum is what we think of as route-based navigation. It guides the kinds of plans that you do on autopilot. So for example, you're commuting to work in the morning, you come out of your gate, um, you turn right, you walk down to the end of the street to the lights, you turn left and so on. You don't really think about it. So the striatum is governing uh, sequences of actions that are linked together, and they're often linked together around features in the environment, so doorways and stairs and things that offer themselves up. And you can follow a route without necessarily really knowing uh, the big picture of where you are. This is another navigational system in the brain called the hippocampus, which you can see the long, skinny red structure on the brain on the right. Now, the hippocampus is involved in making a map of space. This is the part of the brain that you use when you need to flexibly understand where you are and to think about how you're going to get to where you want to go. So, for example, let's say you're following a route, you've been guided by your striatum, and you come across some kind of block in the road. Now you need to flexibly replan your route. You need to figure your way around that block. And so you need to call to mind a map, a mental map of the space. That's the function of the hippocampus. We now know that the hippocampus does more than just make a map for navigation. In fact, the map that it makes is the seat of our entire life store of memories. So when you have a significant experience, the brain links together in the hippocampus the uh, location where the event occurred and the event itself. So for example, this is my parents on their honeymoon. And many years later, returning to that place or even looking at a photograph of that place will bring back the memories of this really important life experience. So the hippocampal map is not just a navigational aid, it's the seat of our life's experiences and in some senses of who we are. So it's very important and we're trying to understand how it works. Now, neurobiologists have been peering into the hippocampus for a um, number of years now, several decades in fact, and they're trying to understand the neurons in the hippocampus construct this map. So they listen in on what the cells are saying to each other. So here is a typical experiment. A rat is walking around on a platform, and you can see the path that it took. That's the squiggly line. And um, brain signals from the rat are being recorded and shown on an oscilloscope. So the trace on the right shows you a typical oscilloscope trace. And the little spiky things that you can see in the trace that are marked by the red squares, those are nerve impulses. So this one neuron in the hippocampus is firing off these little impulses. Now, if you place the red square representing each of those impulses on the place where the rat was at the moment that the cell made that impulse, then you can build up a picture of the relationship between when the cell is active and where the animal was. Now here is a schematic to show you the type of data that we collect when we're doing these types of experiments. So the imaginary rat is walking around and you can see the curly path. And we're recording two cells. One of them is shown in red and one of them is shown in green. And you can see that the nerve impulses from each of those cells are very congregated in one place. So these are called place cells. And we think that what they are doing is making a map of space, something like a UI here signal. 
Now, we now know that there are many types of navigational cell in the brain. What you can see on the right is a different kind of cell called a head direction cell. This is near the hippocampus, and this cell fires whenever the animal walks in a particular direction. So in this case, whenever the animal walks down to the southwest, the cell becomes active. It doesn't matter where the animal is. It's not a place cell. It's a head direction cell. The third really interesting kind of navigational cell that we've recently discovered is called a grid cell. And you can see the nerve impulses from this grid cell appearing on the picture over there. And you'll notice that it's a little like a place cell in that the nerve impulses are all in particular places. But it's unlike a place cell in that there are many places where that cell fires. And in actual fact, if you watch the cell for long enough, you see that a pattern builds up. These places where that cell is firing are very, very regularly spaced. And they make a remarkably um, grid-like pattern, hence the name grid cells. Now, the only way that they could do that is if they're tracking the distance and direction that the rat was walking and constantly keeping an online record. And we think that the cells might be doing something like making um, a map grid, a hexagonal map grid, if you like, so that the hippocampal cognitive map knows something about scale and distances. So in the brain, we've seen many types of cells, but these are the canonical ones. The place cells, which seem to be the basis of a map, the head direction cells, which are a compass, and the grid cells, which are an odometer, something that tracks distance. And we've studied these cells to get some insights into how the rat's brain, and, and by inference the human brain, is processing information about the world. And we've learned many important things. One of the things that we've learned is that the types of information that these cells use are, as you might imagine, the types of information that would have been around in the natural world when we were evolving our brains. So the head direction cells, for example, require large, distant landmarks to help orient and to help figure out the sense of direction. Uh, the, um, the place cells need information about landmarks and information about the boundaries and so on and so on. So we're getting a lot of insights about how the system works by studying rats. Now, what about cities? So when we invented farming, and instead of <coughs> moving through the countryside, we became rooted to one spot. And the cities we built are there to service our needs. So they provide us with the things that we need, our employment and our food and all of our resources. And over the many, many thousands of years that we've been developing them, they've become enormous. So millions and millions of people live in cities. Now, it's quite difficult to navigate in cities because we didn't design them with navigation in mind, where it's not very obvious which way is north, for example. The buildings all look the same. You can't see past them from one space to the next. And you often find yourself in this kind of situation. You're trapped in some nightmarish world where all this is probably very familiar to you. Um, all the spaces look the same. They're symmetric, so rectangular, so you, you can't tell just by looking which way you're facing in them. There's no landmarks. You can't see how the space relates to the space around. You're forced to just follow the signs, follow the staircases. When you pop up into the outside world, you really have no idea which way you're facing. As a result of the, this deprivation of navigational information, we're forced to rely on artificial aids to find our way around. We use our smartphones, we use maps, we follow signs, we ask people for directions. We have no idea where we really are. As we move through the city, we really can't relate our location here and now to the spaces around. And as a result, we don't really feel connected to the city, we don't really feel we belong in the city, and we don't really care about the city all that much. So I think, as a neurobiologist, we should be rethinking how we design cities. How can we do this? I think that we should be um, implementing a philosophy called rewilding, which is actually something that is being applied to nature, but we can apply it to our cities as well. So rewilding means restoring natural habitats so that natural ecosystems can flourish. Now, as humans, we don't think that we need rewilding. We think it's for the animals. But actually, of course, we are animals. 
and we should be thinking about the habitat that our brains evolved in and trying to recreate a habitat that interacts best with our brains. So cities that have natural features that make use of forests and rivers and topography, that provide things that our head direction cells can use to set the sense of direction, that can provide memorable spaces that our play cells can use to anchor not just our sense of space but also our memories. So I think that we need to rethink cities and build cities for the future that are really more like the landscapes of the past and regain our sense of belonging in the world. Thank you for your time.